Each Sunday evening at the Inn of Good Hope, a local rugby team will come in after the game. Now, in case you don't know, rugby players are a total headache when they're pissed. With me being aware of Graham's mental health issues, I had told him that I would be the one to deal with him if there happened to be any trouble. Graham was to remain an observer and could just back me up. One Sunday, a barmaid came over saying she had a problem getting paid by one of the rugby lads. I approached the six or seven of them, who were already pretty drunk. I really didn't need any drama, and I was hoping to smooth out the situation in an amicable way. So I asked the guy why he didn't pay his bill. He told me he'd put £20 on the bar and that someone had eaten it, so he wouldn't be paying again. I started to tell him that he wouldn't be served any more drinks until the last ones were paid for, when one of his mates said, don't tell him what he can and can't have, and if you've got a problem with us, then come and try your luck with me. Oh God, I thought, here we go. Not because I was concerned about the big guy, but because I had spotted Graham had approached and was standing right behind him. Graham, being an ex-professional footballer, had been taught to headbutt through a target for optimum power. So when Graham spun this guy round and headbutted him, he was knocked out cold before he hit the deck. Like a lot of pub fights, the first minute was mayhem. It's when everybody wants to join in and is full of adrenaline and confidence. After the first few violent acts, however, you can usually spot the men from the boys. I ended up in front of two of the rugby lads with a broken chair leg in my hands. I could see they didn't really want it, and I didn't really want to hurt them anyway. So I told them it was in their best interests if they did one quickly, which they did. When I turned round, I could see two unconscious on the floor, one either side of Graham. Graham himself was like a human sandwich between two further guys, one grappling with him from the front, the other from behind. Approaching from the rear, I had a free shot, which usually I aimed straight at the jaw. However, the previous week I'd been at home making a cup of coffee, and after stirring the boiling hot drink, I jokingly pressed the teaspoon on our Mark's neck. Of course, he reacted furiously, and as I was trying to run away, he punched me in the centre of my back, leaving me in horrific pain. So in an instant, I decided to hit the guy with a 90% punch in the centre of his back. To my horror, the punch had no effect. He turned around and picked me up by the waist, literally leaving my legs dangling in the air. He may have been a big effort, but he obviously wasn't the smartest, as he had left my hands free. So before he squeezed me to death, I pulled his head back and pounded his jaw. After having learned from my first punch, I let him have the extra 10% in the second one. He fell back onto the bar stunned. He was at my mercy, but I could see the look on his face had changed, and he didn't want any more. My next problem was stopping Graham from finishing him off. I growled at him to make a quick exit while I attempted to restrain Graham. He was jumping up and down with rage. I realised in a moment that it would take a 30 stone silverback gorilla to hold Graham down. His power was immense. The following Sunday, the nearest thing you could get to a silverback gorilla came down to the end. He was one of the biggest men I ever saw and he was screaming that he wanted to fight the man who beat his friends up. Not being a hero, I said, I think he means you, Graham. The guy was clearly the hard man of the rugby club. So when Graham disposed of him under 30 seconds, the team received a message loud and clear that no one could beat Graham. So either come in and behave or don't come in at all. The Sunday after, 40 or more, basically the entire rugby club and associates rocked up with only one thing in mind, which was to seriously hurt us. Chaos quickly ensued and we had to retreat back through the pub and over the bar defending ourselves with pool cues and chairs before we could lock ourselves in the back room. It was carnage, but we lived to fight another day, even if the pub looked a little worse for wear. That incident confirmed something for me. The whole community officially hated us. That was a little extract from One Punch Doyle, Paul to Paul Doyle, One Punch Doyle, his book, which is Surviving the Madness. Fantastic book. I've done other little extracts as well. You can purchase this link in the description from Amazon or in print format. So Graham Boardman, let's talk about him for a second. What a fascinating character. I've really dug deep and tried to find out more information. Obviously, Paul was his best friend, so he knew him best. And he did. He mentioned that he played football for Coventry, which I guess would have been at a younger level or would have been like a B-team type of uh, gig. I can't find any mention of him in any of the historic 
Coventry archives. I've contacted the club, can't get anyone to get me to give me a call back to let me know whether he was or wasn't. I've reached out to friends of mine in Salford and Manchester. No one, they all know of him, and a lot of the people had met him and had seen him in action, even. But he's quite a mysterious fellow. Like, there's one newspaper cutting um, regarding his, his disappearance, or a couple about his disappearance, and one about an arrest that he had. But this guy was supposedly ultra, ultra dangerous, lethal. Um, you know, not a guy that was. A particularly nice person he didn't treat women well at all according to his best friend he would just go over the top with violence he would use weapons immensely strong um a head case really i mean he, his best friend called him psychotic but having said that he he had a like a he used to put on like a plum accent and stuff so i don't know if he was actually from manchester or salford why would he have been playing at coventry um, so I'm not sure where he was originally. I don't know if anyone can tell me in the comments if they know where he was from originally. I'm guessing that he, at some point, I guess when he was younger, he moved to the Manchester Salford area. But I would be fascinated to hear more about him, anyone who was friends of him or knew him. Uh, for those who don't know, he is. it's thought by the police, National Crime Agency, and his friends that he met a really grisly death. Um, in the book, Paul Doyle goes on about this guy in Holland, a, a huge crime boss globally, who he fell out with. He'd actually worked for him for a bit as a, him and Paul had worked for him as a minders. As minders, they'd been involved in stuff over there with him. Um, apparently Graham Bourbon came back from like six months or whatever working with him and was a different person because of the gruesome stuff he got up to with this person. Um, but then he fell out. They got blamed for a missing shipment. I spoke to people about that, and they're not sure whether they did steal it or it was a misunderstanding. But whatever happened, tempers frayed, and this big crime boss and Graham were going hammer and tong, telling each other what gruesome things they were going to do to each other once they caught up with them. Um, and unfortunately, it seems that Graham got lured over to Spain and then was collared and had a terrible, terrible death, tortured a lot. I know I'll get a lot of comments asking me who this crime boss was, who he fell out with, and they went to war against each other and who allegedly killed Graham. Although I think officially he's still a missing person. But it's not for me, to, it's not for me to say because there's no actual facts and the person and nobody has been charged for it up to yet i believe even though the police say they have put graham down as being you know passed i don't think they ever found any remains or any trace so it could be that he's still a missing officially down as a missing person although i think the police did close the case but we have to remember the family i don't know who the family of graham bourbons are but you've got a Remember that the family and friends still grieve. Paul has definitive, definitively said he is dead. But like I say, I can't say that myself. And it's up to you to read the book and put the pieces together yourselves. With that being said, I'm going to leave it at that today. I hope you enjoyed it. Smash the likes if you enjoyed the, the reading today, the audio reading. Subscribe if you haven't already and hit the notifications but I will try and put videos up at 4 p.m. They'll either be audio reading like this or it'll be a more in-depth documentary. They take a bit longer to do or it'll be news archive research. Take care.